Uh, good, a very, very good afternoon to all of us this afternoon uh, as we gather here for this very, very exciting uh, discussion. Our topic this afternoon is also equally an excited, exciting one, the uncounted civil society and politics of data of the global HIV response. I will tell you later where this title came from. But uh, just to kickstart us off, my name is Lois Chingandu. I'm the director of uh, Frontline AIDS. My name is, let me text that one again. My name is Lois Chingandu. I'm the director of evidence and influence at Frontline AIDS. My apologies, Christy. Um, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today for this uh, very, very exciting meeting. Um, we have hope that this is going to be a uh, you know, fairly informal discussion as we discuss this very important uh, topic. We want to spend a lot of our time discussing rather than listening to presentations. So I will urge all the presenters to really, really stick to time. Uh, if possible, if you can take less time, I will reward you with more uh, opportunities to speak. Um, our, um, this is a, a virtual meeting, as you all know, we have translation in, in French and Spanish. Um, so please turn off your phones or turn them on silent. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the discussion. We know that you will want to make comments throughout the discussion, but please keep them separate. Uh, put them in the, in the box of uh, uh, comments. We will have time to address all our comments. So you can see there is the translation on the screen. To start our meeting today, I would like to invite my executive director, the, the actual executive director of Frontline AIDS, uh, Ms. Christine Stegling, to give us some opening remarks. Thank you. Christine? Uh, Christine, over to you to give us opening remarks. Yeah, hello. Sorry, I lost you for a second. I lost the last few sentences you said. Anyway, I'm back. So first of all, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. I know we're all a little bit zoomed out, or I am at least. So um, I hope we can still make a good, good use of this space. I sometimes feel like even though we're zoomed out, it has also given us an opportunity to feel even a little bit more connected with each other now that we keep on meeting in this virtual space. So let's take it with that sentiment. Um, let's start the day with or the afternoon with that sentiment. Um, I'm really excited about the seminar today and very happy that we're joined by Meg, who is the author of the book, The Uncounted. Um, Lois will say more about that in a minute, but really warm welcome to you, Meg. Um, and I'm equally excited to see all our friends and colleagues. Um, many of you are friends of Frontline, Glo uh, Frontline Aids, but also personal friends, Juan, Amira, Nadia, and Jono. So welcome all of you. I'm very happy to be with you um, this afternoon. Lois will do the proper introductions, but I thought it would be weird if I didn't acknowledge um, you're all here. So this webinar will focus on the impact um, that prioritization of limited resources by donors and by multilateral agencies has on community organizations. So it asks the question of what happens when UNAIDS selects a few fast track countries or when, or when the Global Fund establishes eligibility criteria. What does that mean for marginalized populations? at higher risk of HIV infections in countries that have not been prioritized? What does such prioritization mean for civil society organizations that either represent those communities or work as allies of um, those most marginalized? What happens to the support of those organizations in relatively rich countries that persecute those populations and restrict civil society space? These are the questions we want to ask ourselves today and we want to talk about today. The webinar is 
based or built on the premise that global and national resources for um, to, to address HIV and indeed um, health are limited. And you might argue with that, um, whether they are indeed limited or not, but let's, um, let's uh, start from the premise that they are limited and that therefore there will always be some sort of prioritization. We know that donors have well thought through and perfectly solid criteria for funding, but we also know that this has an impact for those who are not prioritized. So this webinar is not necessarily an attempt at prioritization, but a thoughtful analysis and exchange on limitations and the effect of the systems that have been created. We also are planning to organize a meeting with donors and partners, funding partners, to have a, um, to, to have a meaningful exchange on the implications of their respective prioritization criteria. So watch this space. There will be a hopefully a follow-up conversation to this. We're also aware that there often isn't a unique voice or a unified voice from civil society across all countries or even within one country. For some um, organizations, the criteria chosen by donors is fine. For others, it isn't. Speakers today come from countries and regions who sit that sit in very different places within the different systems of prioritization and eligibility. And with varying degrees of national responses to the challenges that HIV and other health challenges um, are presenting in the country. So we hope that the conversation that we're having today will make for a rich and diverse discussion. We won't always agree or we won't all speak with the same voice, but we want to hear those different voices and make sense of the different voices on the topic. I'm definitely looking forward to it. We hope this will be an open dialogue, mainly among civil society responding to HIV. And it will be a space to hear from each other's or uh, about each other's realities um, and challenges. I think it's also important that we think about this dialogue coming at a really um, opportune moment. As we know, there's many of our um, partners that we're influenced by or that are influencing the work that we do, such as UNAIDS and the Global Fund, um, but also the HIV department of WHO are all in the process of rethinking their strategies um, for the next few years. And undoubtedly, those conversations will make um, reference to some form of prioritization. So I think it's a good time to have this conversation. Let me stop here and wish you all a fruitful and exciting afternoon or evening. I can see it's very dark where Juan is sitting. It is late for some of you. Um, and let's hope that we can have it with some energy, despite this, uh, the fact that we are all sitting in very disparate locations um, and um, that we can actually have a conversation rather than a set of, of statements made by different um, people. So I welcome you all and I will end here and hand over back, back over to Lois. Thank you very much, uh, Christine, for those uh, really provocative questions. I think to your set of questions, I, I am adding the question, what happens if you are born in one of those villages or countries or communities that is considered a non-priority? I am sure our esteemed guests and panelists will be able to answer some of those questions this afternoon. Our, the format of our presentation this afternoon is that we have a, a panel of presenters, just two, and then we have a, a, a panelist of presenters who will make short presentations and then we open up for questions. So without further ado, I will take this moment to introduce our very, very, very esteemed guest. Her name is Meg Davis. She is an author of the Uncounted um, book that we were to Christine talked about. She has 20 years of experience in anthropology, health, and human rights as a scholar and a practitioner. The book Meg is presenting today is the core of this webinar, The Uncounted Politics of Data in Global Health. 
It explores how data-driven health priority setting reinforce, reinforces existing discrimination. She is also embarking on a new project, project which will focus on digital health and human rights. So let me not spoil uh, it for her. Let me just hand over straight to Sarah Meg Davis. She, the, the, she's here to just you know, share us um, yeah, about what is in your book, what was the motivation, what made you uh, address this topic? Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Lois, Christine, Enrique, Nazarene, the whole team at Frontline AIDS for making space in the middle of a crisis, multiple crises in many countries to talk about these important issues. It's really an honor to be here with you and to rejoin friends and colleagues that I've known through in different capacities over years working in, in health and human rights. Um, so yeah, so my name is Sarah Lilo Margaret Davis. Most people know me as Meg. Um, I'm based now as a research fellow at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. So I'm gonna do some inevitable slides uh, for you and uh, we'll share these afterwards for those who wanna look at them more slowly. Um, and then really looking forward to the conversation and from learning from this group. So uh, I'm presenting uh, as Lois uh, kindly uh, mentioned this uh, research from this new book, The Uncounted Politics of Data and Global Health, which is uh, available from Cambridge University Press and independent booksellers online and near you. Um, at the end of this, I'll share uh, some information about how to get it uh, at a discounted price and also contacts if you'd like to get some free chapters because I'm happy to share that. Um, what I wanna talk about today is a global climate of manufactured scarcity and what that means and look at really the machinery uh, behind prioritization in global health um, and really open this up with the hope that this becomes useful for all of you in your thinking and reflection and advocacy, whether it's engaging with the Global Fund, PEPFAR, the UK, France, uh, anybody else, JICA, whoever it is. So the book uh, begins in 2016 when a network of Venezuelan people living with HIV wrote a letter to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria here in Geneva, where I live to ask for emergency aid in order to access antiretroviral treatment. The Venezuelan health system had collapsed. People had no food. There was a real crisis. And the Global Fund is a well-endowed institution, right? Uh, largest multilateral funder for health. Uh, this is the old building where I used to work uh, in Blondinay, which is the, where the letter went to at that time in 2016. At that time, they were dispersing uh, between two and $3 billion a year to over 100 countries for national health programs and I worked there on uh, their human rights uh, strategy. So the response that came from, at that time, the executive director, uh, Mark Dybel and board chair Norbert Hauser to the activists was no, Venezuela was not eligible for aid from the Global Fund. And many people asked why, as clear crisis, people living with HIV need treatment, why were they not eligible? And the answer really has to do with indicators, numerical indicators, what a uh, great anthropologist, Sally Engel Mary, who sadly recently passed away, what she calls the tools of global governance. There's a limited bucket of funds, this is the premise, and the Global Fund has an eligibility policy approved by its board. And according to the terms of that policy, Venezuela was not eligible for several reasons. First, because it was classified as a high income country based on its gross national income per capita, GNI per capita, the World Bank classified it as a high income country, therefore no funding, any more than you would give funding to the US or the UK. But as this debate was continuing about Venezuela, the economy continued to collapse. And the following year, Venezuela was a middle income country. So for middle income countries, the Global Fund had another uh, criteria to sort through which middle income countries get funding and which do not. And this is HIV disease burden. High burden countries are eligible if they're middle income low burden countries or not. But the Venezuelan government at this time was suppressing health data because the health data revealed the state of the collapse, many people believed. Therefore, there was no official health data when the Minister of Health tried to publish health data, she was fired. So there was no official health data and especially there was no data about key populations. There is especially believed to be high burden of HIV among men who have sex with men and transgender people in Venezuela but due to widespread homophobia, transphobia, denialism, there was no data on how many key populations there were in Venezuela or how much HIV there was among them. 
the global funds eligibility policy treated no data as a zero. So they're not eligible for that reason as well. And so it's all these series of numbers that create this global health eligibility architecture and Venezuela just kept falling through the gaps. And this sparked a massive controversy for those who were involved in this sector at the time. You may remember public letters, denunciations, arguments, yada, yada, went on for a while because this is a global fund and it's transparent and people know what happens and they have seats on the board and there's debate about it. But the, the global fund is kind of an easy target. So I pick on the global fund because I know it because there was this public controversy. There are, I'm sure, similar controversies underway at PEPFAR, you know, at DFID, whatever it's called now, FCO. Yeah. Anyway, every aid agency has these kinds of controversies, but most of them we don't get to see or participate in. Um, the problem is that the funding is not enough to meet the available needs and who lives and who dies comes down to data. And so this book is really about these and other life and death decisions that get made using data and the political and economic forces that shape the selection of indicators, the construction of indicators and the data that is used to report against them. And aid eligibility is one good example of this because many aid agencies use this. So the global fund in using GNI per capita, of course, national income per capita, as a criterion for aid eligibility aligns the global fund with its donor, donor countries. So the US, the UK, OECD, France, European Union, they all rely on GNI per capita as one of the key criteria they use to select countries. Um, and so this is a, a critical piece. I think if we really, there's a lot of talk now about decolonizing global health. If we wanna do that, we can't really decolonize global health until we really decolonize health aid. Because at the moment, health aid and the agendas of health aid, the priorities of health aid, are set by donor countries, which are former colonial powers. And until that dynamic is addressed and pulled apart and changed, I think global health will continue to be very much repeating existing power dynamics. Anyway, in this case, GNI per capita, this one number averages out across a country how much income they have. We can talk more about how that's designed. There are a lot of critics of it, and especially because these are two pictures from Grenada, a country I spent a lot of time in, fortunately for me, while working on this book. The marina, where beautiful yachts are, billion dollar yachts in some cases, and a shanty in the countryside. Grenada is like many other middle income countries, like many countries, there is vast inequality. And so using GNI per capita renders that inequality invisible and really doesn't reveal who we need to be targeting and, and where the money needs to go. And at the time that I wrote this book, the Global Fund Board was in the middle of a year long intense debate about its eligibility policy and about what criteria should be used for uh, to determining who's eligible for funding and for which diseases. And this debate took place against the backdrop of the pressure to reach the sustainable development goals on health, which I'm sure many people on this call know very well. So SDG 3.3 has one target, which is to end HIV, TB, and malaria by 2030. For HIV, the argument set out by UNAIDS for reaching this goal was to use treatment as prevention. And you see here uh, a chart I'm sure many of you have seen before in meetings and on reports and so forth. This was the prediction for the fast track approach that was set out in 2016 that said, if we scale up treatment dramatically and especially in high burden countries and we get 90, 90, 90, right? 90% 90 of people living with HIV to test and know their status, 90% of those to initiate treatment and 90% of people on treatment to achieve viral suppression so that they can no longer transmit HIV, then we could bring the epidemic under control. And so those red dots uh, on the top charts, which show mathematical models predicting what would happen if we stayed at existing levels of coverage, uh, you, the contrasting picture is the blue dots, which showed if we scale up treatment as prevention, we could then bring the epidemic under control, bend the curve was the the slogan uh, at the Global Fund when I work there and among many other agencies as well. And the bilateral agencies that give to the Global Fund, UNAIDS, WHO, et cetera, are under intense pressure to demonstrate to constituents that they are making progress. But the problem is that the progress was difficult to make because there wasn't enough money. And as this chart shows, and this is a, uh, an update from UNAIDS, there was a significant shortfall of funding so uh, the amount needed was far greater than the amount available at that time, and this was before COVID. And so given the lack of uh, adequate funding, there's a need to focus funds. So we need to set priorities. The first priority was among countries. So which countries do we focus on? And here PEPFAR in particular, but others as well agreed, 
focus on the high burden countries. If we can bring HIV down to a more manageable level in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, then uh, we begin to really have an impact on the global epidemic. So money was focused on high burden countries and within each country there was mapping, right? Focus on locations and populations is another one of those slogans from 2016. Map out where the clinics are, map out where high uh, rates of transmission are happening and focus the money there. Take the money out of the middle income countries that have low burden. So Latin America, Caribbean, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Asia and the Pacific, Middle East and North Africa, concentrate money in Sub-Saharan Africa where there are large numbers of people living with HIV. Find the positives, another slogan from PEPFAR. Not especially respectful, but anyway, that was a slogan. Find the positives, target the money to the locations and the populations. But of course, for key populations, targeting is extremely challenging. And the UNAIDS models all depended on non-discrimination. They depended on the idea that if you scale up treatment as prevention, everyone will be able to access it equally. And that's an unstated assumption in the model that I just showed you, the one with the red dots and the blue dots, doesn't say we're assuming that all clinics will be non-discriminatory, but they are assuming that. They're assuming something that we know not to be true. And that assumption is unstated, but shapes the whole model and shapes the narrative for 90-90-90, that if you just fund enough treatment, everyone will be able to access it. In fact, however, of course, as we know very well, Christine, Enrique, others on this call have done huge amounts of work to document how human rights violations actually fuel the spread of HIV, especially among key populations. So this is what Seaver calls the unquantified remainder that haunts math, the on the ground realities, people and realities that are not counted and not measured. And this is um, an image from a slide uh, from, uh, from a study that I did uh, with some students in 2017 at NYU, in which we found that criminalization of same sex sexuality countries that criminalize, so each of these blue dots is a country, uh, that they would have smaller size estimates, implausibly small or no size estimates for men who have sex with men, um, and in some cases close to zero, where they criminalize uh, same-sex sexuality and punish it with the death penalty, you get down very close to zero in terms of size estimates for men who have sex with men. In other words, you can't count key populations where people are criminalized. And so most countries have little or no data about key populations. Uh, one 2015 study found that out of 140 countries, fewer than 100 had a size estimate for even one key population group. And it may not be the one they need to have the size estimate for. It's the one that they can get data on, which means it's probably the group that is not as stigmatized. Um, so for example, for transgender women, uh, UNAIDS estimates that at least one in five, I believe maybe higher by now, uh, transgender women is living with HIV globally but the vast majority of countries have no size estimate for transgender women. Uh, I think it's currently something like 30 to 35 countries that have ever reported any data on transgender women to UNAIDS. And that's just an apocalyptic gap when it comes to trans women. And so the models that predicted that you could bend the curve of the HIV pandemic uh, through scaling of treatment did not factor in discrimination, did not factor in criminalization, didn't make it explicit that they were not considering that as part of their modeling. So this is the study. And this gets to what Steph Morrell and Matt Greenall wrote a brilliant blog about back in, I think, 2015 or so, um, called The Data Paradox, from a, a great blog that Matt used to run called Where There Is No Data. So many countries deny, negate the existence of key populations. And so no data is gathered about those populations' needs, or they're underestimated. So it's small, implausibly small size estimates. Uh, that, that means that they're not a priority because the numbers are so small that you can't make an impact on the epidemic by focusing on this population. Therefore, there's no resources allocated to programs that would save people's lives for key populations. And that reinforces the lack of data and the lack of data reinforces the negation. Or as you might also say, absence of evidence of key populations becomes evidence of absence. No data means they are not considered to exist. And this has devastating results, of course. Um, you know, one, one of those, I'm gonna just identify two, one result of having implausibly small or absent size estimates for key populations is that countries may think that they are reaching key populations when in fact they are failing to reach key populations. If for instance, Algeria, which at one point re reported that they had 97% HIV testing among men who have sex with men, when they talk to people who know the country like Nadia Rafif and others, 
uh, they were just astonished by that. They said 97%, that's impossible. Well, you look at their size estimate for men who have sex with men, they had estimated 59 men who have sex with men in the country. 57 tested for HIV, therefore 97% coverage for men who have sex with men. Hungary, another example I like to quote, uh, reported 100% HIV testing coverage for men who have sex with men out of a population of 300. So they rounded up 300 men, tested them, 100% coverage, voila. So this is one problem with small and implausible size estimates is countries can then claim they're being successful when they're not. And the second problem it creates is for cost effectiveness software. And I can geek out about cost effectiveness software later if we have time. But basically this is software that um, countries are being encouraged to use by UNAIDS, WHO, by donors to set their priorities, to figure out what is the benefit you get based on the cost of the intervention. And if you look at the software, essentially it's pitting key populations against the general population because each intervention is for a population. So if you think that there are only 59 MSM in your country, for instance, in the case of Algeria or 300 MSM, then they're not gonna turn up as being cost-effective as an investment compared to larger groups such as, you know, uh, female uh, women who have sex with men, right? So it, the, the, depending on how you group the populations, key populations are just reinforced as being too small to have much of an impact and they're not a cost-effective intervention. So cost-effectiveness essentially creates winners and losers. When you, when you look at cost-effectiveness literature, they're very frank about this, like yeah, there will be winners and losers. The problem is that when you select winners and losers in the HIV pandemic, you're doing it in a context of existing discrimination that's historic and widespread. And so the cost effectiveness can just reinforce that existing criminalization and discrimination, which creates invisibility. The people who lost in the past will continue to be the losers in the future. So uh, the problem, uh, as many of you now know, is as we start to see, and this was all pre-COVID, so it's even worse now, of course, but as the global fund and other donors began to transition out of middle-income countries, we begin to see a rise in HIV infections and especially among key populations. So at the time the, the Global Fund was last debating its eligibility policy, there were 13 countries in transition. It's probably more today. Uh, and at the same time, civil society on the board of the Global Fund was pushing to keep eligibility as inclusive as possible. So this is Rico Gustav, who I'm sure many of you know is the executive director of Global Network of People Living with HIV and on the board of the Global Fund now chair of the strategy committee. And he, among others, were, were raising concerns about this very consistently, even five years ago, pointing out that key populations are being lost in transition, that while we have a reduction of deaths in sub-Saharan Africa, we now have a significant increase in new infections among key populations everywhere, especially places like Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And this is mostly represented by Russia, of course. Um, today, I believe it's something like 62% of new infections globally are among key populations. And this is the crisis that we're now beginning to see uh, caused by rationing because we don't have enough funds. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, I just realized I have failed to print out one of my pages, but okay, I think I can wing it. Um, <laughs> it's like always check if you printed out all your pages. Um, so here we have um, the three uh, groups that lead the civil society delegations on the Global Fund Board at the time that I was writing this. From left to right, you have Alan Maleche, who was uh, at that time leading the uh, developing country NGO delegation to the Global Fund Board. Um, Maureen Malenga, um, Maureen Moranga, Mike Podmore, who's from a developed country NGO delegation, and Rico again, uh, from communities. And so as I was uh, supporting them at that time as a consultant on the board, they were really pushing to try to keep, uh, keep key populations in middle income countries included um, in the global fund eligibility policy. And we're, we're having to really argue against some of the donor delegations. And uh, I think the role of civil society in engaging in these discussions is very important. Um, in the Global Fund Board, they are far outnumbered and outweighed by the donors and by the, the, the government delegations, uh, but they you know, don't even have a voice at all in terms of decision-making for other donors such as PEPFAR. And so having civil society and global health governance, I think is critical for pushing back on some of these decisions. 
The other piece that was uh, very important as I was working on all of this was that I had the opportunity in the Eastern Caribbean to follow along uh, as um, CVC, Caribbean Vulnerable Communities, worked with community-based groups to do a participatory action research study in which they trained and worked in partnership with key populations led groups to design research to gather size estimation studies for key populations um, and then empower those groups to use that data in advocacy. So it was a really groundbreaking study. It was for these six countries the first time that they'd had key population size estimates. And uh, unfortunately, however, it was an amazing process, but the government agencies that had received the funding for the study refused to publish it and have still not published it to this day. Partly, I think, probably out of concerns about the political backlash that might be generated if this uh, kind of groundbreaking documentation of the sizes of uh, the key populations became publicly available. Um, but also, I think, out of concerns about targets that they had set, which would now be shown to be insufficiently ambitious. But this kind of research, I think, was really critical for civil society engaged in global health advocacy. So here's Alan Maleche again on the Global Fund board table uh, facing off in a discussion about uh, the eligibility policy uh, with a candle burning next to him in memory of people who use drugs in Eastern Europe and Central Asia who passed away um, from HIV and TB related causes. And uh, this was in Macedonia, the Skopje board meeting. And they managed to successfully fight to, uh, for a new little footnote in the policy that was quite powerful, which said that if a government has no data on key populations, it's no longer just not eligible. What happens now is that the Global Fund has to talk to UNAIDS and get alternative data from civil society, from academic research, other sources that is credible that could be used to understand the needs of key populations in that country. So that was a big win for a little footnote. And they also managed to get uh, aid, uh, a small amount of aid for Venezuela. So uh, I'm just gonna wrap up here with two things I wanted to share because I think this is you know, a good time to think about, is this the best machinery to use? Is there a better way to structure priorities? I don't have the answers to that, but I do have a list of questions. And so these are questions and it's on my blog and I'll, I can share the link later as well, um, of questions to ask if you're in a meeting and you see indicators and targets and to understand um, how to interrogate what kinds of questions we can be asking about those things um, and mathematical models that get shown to us. And how can we can question the assumptions and the data that are being used to set priorities. And then finally, I just wanted to say thank you again. This is a discount code for those who are interested to acquire the book. Uh, it's S Davis 20, you get 20% off. Um, you can sign up for updates. And if you email me at that, at my Gmail address, I'm happy to share a few chapters uh, for free and also the indicators questions. So thank you all very much. Look forward to the discussion. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Sarah Davis, for that glimpse into what the book is all about. There were really key messages that uh, I think you draw out in your, in your discussion. And the, a few of them really resonated with me. The issue of cost effectiveness, creating winners and losers in a context of, for, of for existing discrimination. Very painful to hear that. But I think uh, none of us can sit here and say this is easy because we know if you don't have the resources, somehow you need to make choices. But how do we make those choices in a way that uh, you know, takes into consideration other particularly key populations whom we know are already discriminated within our societies? So Frontline AIDS has spent a few years through one of its um, members um, who is about to present. I, let me introduce Enrique Ristoy. He's an expert in human rights and human rights-based development. He's currently the head of evidence at Frontline AIDS. Um, Enrique has uh, made an effort together with other colleagues to look uh, to see if there can be an alternative of, of looking at prioritization. We don't want to claim that this is going to be the panacea, this is the answer to all problems, but this is a first attempt to do something different. And she is going to um, assist, he's going to assist us and take us through that process and that framework 
so that we can later on discuss whether is this framework in the, in the right direction in trying to answer this difficult prioritization question. His presentation is shared with Lila. So can I invite um, Enrique to present, please? Uh, thank you very much, Lois, and uh, thank you, Meg. I hope you can hear me and you can see the presentation. Just a thumbs up if that's the case. Um, well, thank you so much, Meg. I, uh, you know, when we first uh, thought about the webinar and and we read your book, uh, we thought, you know, Meg really needs to present this because you have given us a summary of a book that I really, I, I really recommend everybody to read with all the conundrums and all the difficulties that we face uh, in the case of Front INAs as a civil society partnership, but uh, all our panelists really um, are confronted to, to the realities of the data politics on HIV. So if you don't mind, before, uh, as, before I present the engagement and presence framework that we have in Front INAs, I would like just to, 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 to go into, um, just to, to put out there a quote from your book, because I, I think this particular quote really almost summarizes it all. Uh, and the, the, a lot of the, 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 the problems that we are inherited by just the, the very outset of how decisions are made. Um, I think there's three things that we can reflect on uh, based on, on the many other things that we can reflect on, but three things that really come to mind that are quite important to, to reflect on when civil society organizations and partnerships like, like ours reflect on the privatization and where they could really put the very limited resources. The first one is, is, is embedded into the whole issue of HIV of 30 plus years of, of the HIV response, is that today nobody, no one in the HIV response or close to it could deny that HIV is fueled by stigma, discrimination and human rights violations. And those affect particular populations, key populations we call, we also refer to them as marginalized populations because that is, that is the reality of, people, of many of the people affected by HIV. Sex workers, transgender people, men who have sex with men, people who use drugs, and in many countries, girls and young women as well. Another clear, clear concept is that no one would establish a direct relationship between the level of stigma and state persecution that happens in a particular country affecting particular populations and the level of wealth and national income of the country. They, these two don't really come together in any way or form. And you mentioned that in your presentation and in your book, data is showing us that most HIV infections are actually taking place among key populations in mostly middle-income countries in regions like Latin America and the Caribbean, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, Middle, uh, Middle East and North Africa regions. Um, so, with all these, um, as civil society working with the most marginalized people affected by HIV, we think that we have a responsibility, we thought we had a responsibility to at least question whether we should follow the overall criterion of national income and all the other criteria to determine where we should work and uh, should, to question whether we should embrace all or in part the criteria used by international donors and agencies. And obviously that has a cost, which is the cost of trying to work where the money isn't. So this is what we've done in Front uh, to try to give us a compass as to where our partnership should work. Um, we have used a, an analytical tool, which is the Presence and Engagement Framework, which uh, Leila and I will present in a minute. But Meg, just if you, if you allow me just to recap on what Meg has already mentioned. And this, as you see here on the left-hand side of the presentation, are some of the key um, <clears throat> elements of prioritization and eligibility, I would never really get this word right, uh, that are on the table for most glo global HIV donors and agencies. Obviously that varies from donor to donor, but this is pretty much, um, uh, these points are pretty much um, general points of, of prioritization. When we came to, to, to looking at these points of prioritization in front line aids, we had a completely different take to them. First, we don't consider national income when we are analyzing where we work and where we should work. Because of what we said before, there is no relation between the effort, the impact of HIV among marginalized populations and the level of the possibility of the means of a particular country to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, address HIV. Because we know the problem is not the money, it's the will. 
Second one is, of course, we, uh, as, as at entry point for us to analyze our presence, should always be the, epidemical, the epidemiological situation. But we do it from a point of view of, first of all, we focus our work is with marginalized populations. So our analysis is on HIV among marginalized populations, not the general public. And uh, we know that for us, it's important not so much the, the, the burden of the epidemic, not so much the size of the epidemic, but how big it is impacting the marginalized populations where we're working. And it, maybe even more importantly, where it is heading. So HIV incidence is very important to us. We want to know uh, in which places the epidemic is not really under control, uh, which gives us an indication that maybe we, we might be welcome to work with partners um, uh, in, that, in those places. The second key consideration for us in prioritizing our presence and our engagement is that stigma and discrimination, human rights violations against key populations, and the level of restrictions to civil society work with, uh, with marginalized with key populations and marginalized populations are key factors prior to deciding where we want to work or where we, we might want to, to think about working. They don't, they don't come after the prioritization has happened, which is often the case uh, with uh, how donors really look at, at the LGBT, eligibility criteria. A very important consideration for us was, is, is almost philosophical, is that our analysis is based on where the marginalized people affected by HIV uh, are regardless of the country where they are. So our analysis are not per country, they are poor per marginalized population. Obviously we all live in countries, and obviously at the end of the day you can refer to country, but our entry point has, point has always been, we don't analyze a country as a whole, we analyze population per population uh, in each country to decide, to give us a nuance about, you know, what we, modest, what, what we could modest, mostly do and, and, and uh, 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 contribute to. Meg really mentioned the data, the absence of data, or who provides the data is very important to, to us. Again, as civil society, we realize that, yes, there is a very robust data coming from, mostly from UNAIDS. A lot of the data, of that data is actually provided by governments, and we said this is useful, but it's not the only data available. It's not the only evidence that we need to, to take into account when deciding uh, our prioritization. So we use various sources of, of evidence, obviously solid evidence, but we take into account uh, research being carried out by civil society and other actors as well. And finally, Ahmed has mentioned it a couple of times, for us, no data is already a sign that there is a problem and, uh, and that we probably really need to work. So we actually uh, put a huge emphasis on when there is lack of data that tells us that maybe uh, this is a place where we should be uh, engaging with civil society uh, partners. Okay, and this is the, 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 uh, the more difficult part, so I will try to just to, to summarize how we do the analysis. So basically our, our presence and engagement um, tool is, is one based on, on the intersection of, two, of the analysis of two create critical areas. Uh, we do a composite for those two areas, basically they, they give us a value uh, whereby we can identify places where, and I, and I will explain this, where we see that there, is, uh, there are marginalized people who are at both at highest risk of HIV and at high risk of uh, human rights violations uh, or, or, as a, uh, or, or, or in a place where civil society is persecuted and it's very difficult to work um, with marginalized populations, where they're highly marginalized, uh, criminalized, uh, marginal and uh, discriminated against. It is the two that really, the, those two axes that you see here, the horizontal and the vertical, that are critical for us. When there is a connection between the two, that's where we think we have something to, to, to contribute to. Um, so, as I said before, our analysis is per marginalized population. We, uh, we do it in a way that, um, th that we can identify areas where, if I give you an example of men who have sex with men, where we think that, uh, that we can contribute to the work of, of uh, organizations working with uh, men who have sex with men in this particular example. And uh, when we do the analysis across uh, countries, 
you, you can see a, a world map which, show, which shows countries where, where either we're working with partners or where we, we would like to, if, if we could, we would like to, to explore working with them. And then you can see here in green, the countries in specifically on uh, working with uh, men who have sex with men that are priority for us, and darker green are the ones where, where the vulnerability towards HIV and to human rights violations is highest. Um, I think just going back to um, to the analysis of, of what I said before, what was it before I do that, I, let me just show you another one. This is the high impact country. So these are uh, the countries where having analyzed uh, all the various marginalized populations across the board, we, we identify countries where there is a, a larger number of marginalized populations who are at highest risk of HIV and human rights violations at the same time. So that really gives us a, the list of five priority countries for us. And I think before I pass on to Leila to show us what kind of information on our analysis is available out there for you guys, and if you wanted more information, we can provide. Um, I just wanted to show this, you this map because this one shows a little bit of a difference between applying our criteria through our tool and the criteria that has been used by, in this case, we just um, uh, uh, we just selected the UNAIDS fast the UNAIDS so UNAIDS fast, fast track countries and um, priority countries. And you see here on this map, um, the blue bits are the ones where we coincide, where we our the areas where we think. Um, it is high priority for us to, to, uh, to explore working, coincides with, uh, with UNAIDS and PEPFAR. But there are pink, the pink areas there where for us it is high priority to explore trying to work and which are no priority at all. So if I give you example, uh, the example of LGBT organizations in let's say Kyrgyzstan, um, organizations that are working very hard trying to provide HIV prevention services to um, MSM and transgender people in a country where data is non-existent and which is highly deprioritized internationally because it is considered to be a, a middle-income country, that is a high priority for us. We're working with um, LGBT organizations in Kyrgyzstan. We, we found funding for it, which is the critical factor here. Um, and that really uh, underlines the difference in prioritization. I just wanted to say that this analysis that we do and this tool of, with all the analyses that we can share with you if you want, um, it's just a, it's just the first um, a lens of, a, a, of analysis that we make. Then there are other considerations to be made, you know, starting with funding and then uh, whether civil society in the particular country is willing to work with us, they're open to it, whether what we are proposing is something that really works uh, or whether we can adapt our programs and our work to, to actually make a proper contribution. Uh, there are risk considerations. There are many other lenses uh, afterwards to consider whether we can actually extend our partnership to a particular place or, not, or continue our work in a particular place. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna pass the floor to Leila to give us a little sense of all three, all three websites that, where you can find some of the information on the analysis that we have made. Uh, Leila, do you want do you want me to continue the presentation, or do you want um, to share? Yes, you could just move to the next slide. That's all okay. I need. To just tell me next slide, and I will do that. I will come. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, just quickly, I'm the advisor for strategic information at Frontline AIDS. Um, I've been helping um, Enrique put some of this data into a format that you can all hopefully interact with and explore for yourself. So um, as, as we've seen on previous slides, um, we've got the, the matrix um, on the left side of the screen here. So this is the, we put each uh, marginalized population into one of the quadrants or even off the scale if the, the HIV impact is even more than, than we've, we've represented. So that shows a really high um, impact population. Um, in order to, to translate this onto the, um, onto the interactive map that we've got, I've put a picture on the right-hand side here. 
um, there'll be a kind of summary score per population. So this one, two, three, four, and five corresponds to the areas on the axes here. Basically, all you need to know is uh, a four or a five um, represents a high HIV impact or a very high HIV impact, along with a highly constrained social and political context for that population. So in the example here, the USA, we've got the MSM, the men who have sex with men, is a two. Therefore, it, they sit um, within this B1 quadrant of high HIV impact, but a low, um, a lower um, social and political context score. So I'm going to share the link. If you can stop sharing now, Enrique, I'll just pop up the website onto the screen so you can see it. Hopefully now you can see my screen. So this is the, the web link to the map that we'll be able to um, share with you just after I present, because I can't do two things at once. Um, and it sort of tells a story. So on this first page, this is all of the countries that were included in the analysis. Um, it's being updated for 2020 at the moment, but at the moment in here is the 2019 um, information. So we, we analyze about 60 countries, um, more or less, one of plus or two minus. Um, if you hover over any of these, um, you can see the, the kind of summary for each of the five marginalized populations that we focused in on, um, along with a TB score and um, a hepatitis C score. So then uh, you can use the filters, you can zoom in on countries and explore the numbers, but we've got some preset filters up here. For example, this will be the uh, men who have sex with men. This is showing the countries where men who have sex with men have a, a high or very high HIV impact, along with a highly constrained social and political context. Um, if we wanted to narrow that down to only the very high impact, then we can see these countries in dark blue. So it's a way to kind of explore per marginalized population. You can keep exploring in your own time. Um, but that's basically the data that we've gathered um, during this uh, presence and, and engagement framework analysis. Okay, th thank you very much, Leda. Um, uh, with, you know, this is about the, the, our panelists and that uh, we're gonna, we're gonna leave in leave it with, to Lois, just to say that thank you so much to our panelists. You are the ones who really carry the expertise and we're we looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, over to you, Lois. Thank you very much um, for that uh, really exciting um, presentation. I think there's an opportunity if people can visit our website, they can play around uh, with that map. Let me just go straight to our panelists and um, ask um, Wana as our first presenter to talk to us about your experience in uh, Vietnam, both um, from that of your organization and generally in the HIV response. Um, please take note that due to our time factor, I'm reducing the time slightly. If you can focus on seven minutes um, rather than the eight minutes. <laughs> if you can save a minute or two, I will appreciate. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And I think the, our um, three presenters have like laid out very um, clearly the part and, and, and also about what we do about it. But from my observation, I think it's, um, I mean, I, I keep thinking there's a, there's a proverb bringing in my head, like out of sight, out of mind. If you don't see people, we don't think about them. If there's no number, it like they don't exist. It like uh, uh, Max says uh, earlier, like uh, the absence of evidence is considered as the evidence of absence. And, and we see that play on the time. Um, I think it is uh, it is uh, one of the um, that when I when I look at um, when I look at it 
um, from, and, and we see it everywhere. We see it not only on HIV, but also on USC, for example. I'm working a lot on universal health coverage and, and we can see that at the country level, as well as at the global level, there are um, group of people, um, their particular population, in particularly the marginalized population, and not in the data of any kind. So nobody pay attention to them. Um, one of the reasons is that because they nobody see them, nobody see the data on them. But I see it from a, um, a slightly different um, aspect. It's, it's not even about cost effectiveness. I see it um, from the, the perspective of uh, accountability. So um, there's an argument that there's, there's not enough resources, so we need to prioritize. But I think that is um, some in, I have a conspiracy theory that the, the people who are responsible just want to remove their responsibility by saying, oh, there's no problem with that. So, um, so let's uh, give us the, the one who have the highest uh, impact or the one who, um, who um, are most uh, affected so that we all rush to, to say, oh, here, look, this the people who give this intervention about this group will make the most impact or most cost effectiveness or um, et cetera. It is just for some people to remove their responsibility in um, doing the intervention for, for serving everyone. It's not acceptable, in particularly in the, in the SDG era, where we are talking about leave no one behind. So it's not only if, if we are true, if the leaders who committed to sustainable development goal are true to themselves, which they are committed to leave no one behind, that means leave no one behind. That means you don't say we pick this group and, and let that group out. Absent of data is one thing, but the other thing is that people should leave no one behind, should be, should be um, the people who committed to leave no one behind need to be held accountable. And, and it's uh, our responsibility to show the hidden, to, to make visible the invisible people, the people who are hidden, the people who are locked up, the people who have no voice, and, and, and then to hold our leader accountable. So leave no one behind is, is that. I don't think we should accept that because say, oh, because we have limited resource. So let's choose Africa over Asia, choose the low um, income country, the country with smaller GN, GNI over the country with a higher GNI. I don't, I don't think we should accept that. Um, but at the same time, to, it's our responsibility, the civil society responsibility to make the, um, the, the, the visible, the, the people who have no voice, the people who are locked up and hidden. Um, I am in a meeting today right here. I'm actually, I'm not at home. I'm in a hotel room because we are um, we're having a, a meeting, um, a workshop on um, to the revision of our HIV law, and um, and one of the um, one of our um, recommendation is to lower the age of consent for HIV testing, and um, and then um, people say um, we need to lower it from sixteen to fifteen because they found that there are people who are the young um, people who are 15 and get infected. The truth is that there are people who are 12 and 13 are infected, but because the age of consent is 16, so they don't come forward, they don't dare to come forward for testing. Mm -hmm. And so it's really our side, our mind, when you talk about the, the, the number, they're not in the number because they just, the barrier that 
Meg mentioned earlier, to just prevent them to come forward for testing. When we have a, um, a give a, an opportunity for them to do, then we see. Um, so, um, so I think this uh, this is is our responsibility to 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 make that visible and to hold our government, our leaders um, accountable for that. Um, there's a counted example, but I just want to mention another group is a um, undocumented and unregistered um, people. So when I, I remember back three years ago when we was working on um, USC um, declaration, the the declaration of USC forum, the language in the declaration is that the government responsible for their citizen. And we have to fight very hard to replace the word citizen with people. Because how about the non citizen? So the government is responsible for non citizen or not. But then here in, in, in our work, we just um, saw a striking example of the undocumented people. Um, I, we came to a province where they say the total fertility rate is very low, it's lower than a replacement um, uh, rate. When we went to the province, every woman had three or four or five children. But but the but those women who have four or five children are migrant children, and there are many of them because the province is a is an industrial zone, and there's so many. There's a the migrant outnumber the local people, and the migrant many of them are not serista, so their children and themselves are not counted in the in the total fertility rate of the of the province, and that province become. A, a, a problem that have no need for for family planning anymore because uh, we we there's a low total fertility rate, so so I think it's uh, we and and in our world of HIV we very often we meet the people um, who who don't have a um, the registration who are not documented and in many cases they are not counted, um, so we. Um, we we are we are working um, on our HIV law at the moment, where the government want the people to show the ID paper if they want to get a confirmatory test. If the if you you need to show your ID to get a confirmatory test, the government do that. They ask for that because they want it easy, make it easy for them to manage to 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 get the data. But then, how about people who don't have an ID paper? Um, so just to just to share some of the reflection on the uh, excellent presentation of other people, and 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 again, we should not accept the prioritization, the eligibility. Leave no one behind is leave no one behind, and 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 our responsibility is to make sure that people become visible and their voice heard. Um, I, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wana. Um, I did capture really important messages, um, but one of the most uh, important one was, if you are not in the number, you don't exist. I think this is being repeated over and over, even by the previous presenters. We go straight to the next presenter, who is uh, Amira Hidoiza. Uh, she's going to present in Spanish. So please uh, go to the interpretation and press your buttons so that you, you don't miss what she is uh, going to be talking about. Uh, similar to Wana, we know you have a privileged overview of HIV response in Ecuador, with Kimirina, Kimirina being a major actor. Um, can you share some of that experience with us? Thank you. Buenos dias con todos y con todas. Ah, yeah. uh, no sé si es que se ve mi presentación. Yes, yes it is. 
Yes, okay. it is. Eh, bueno, creo que voy a ser bastante breve, dado que lo que ya han comentado muchos de los eh, personas que me antecedieron de la palabra es bastante claro. Eh, estoy, debo cambiar de canal, les pido disculpas porque me van a estar escuchando. <risa> eh, bueno, eh, yo hice esta presentación eh, un poco pensando en el contexto de lo que ha pasado en COVID. Oh, qué pena que no me puede, no puedo pasar. Yes, I have, I'm having, I have, I'm having some, some problems, sorry. So, um, le, le, lo que les quiero compartir muy rápidamente es que desde hace 20 años, cuando inicia la institución en la que trabajo, Kim Kina, Eh, nosotros hemos estado insistiendo de que la trampa de manejar las cifras en relación a promedios o usando datos en base a estimaciones es, es muy, está equivocada. Eh, lamentablemente, el manejo de información de esta forma Lo que permite es que queda eh, en desconocimiento la realidad de las personas que están más excluidas. En el caso de eh, la respuesta al VIH, sabemos que las poblaciones clave con las que trabajamos, con quienes estamos militando por un cambio en su salud, en su calidad de vida, Son personas excluidas, son personas que lamentablemente eh, no tienen muchas veces voz, están criminalizadas y tienen condiciones socioeconómicas bastante complicadas. En, en América Latina, eh, la situación de inequidad es bastante grave. Tenemos un índice de desigualdad muy alto, del 0.49, una desigualdad de género muy alta, igualmente de 0.3, y las tasas de natalidad entre adolescentes son muy amplias. Es decir, lo que yo quiero reiterar es que las personas dejadas atrás al cual como aquí lo hemos eh, graficado en relación a lo que Conocida nos ha compartido, están justamente entre las personas con las que más compartimos nuestro trabajo. Ser una mujer transgénero, ser una mujer trabajadora sexual, tiene realmente una situación que no es igual a lo que demuestran los promedios en, en las estadísticas mundiales. En los mapas que vimos antes y en la excelente presentación y felicito el lanzamiento del libro, eh, vimos que hay algunos países que aparecemos en blanco o en gris porque aparentemente no tenemos mayores problemas. Y lo que sucede en estos países como el mío, como Ecuador, es que lamentablemente las estadísticas no existen o las estadísticas son manipuladas de tal manera que eh, finalmente lo que podemos ver es que hay cifras oficiales que se ponen a consideración de la comunidad internacional, pero que no reflejan la situación real de las personas. Y esto es justamente lo que ha sucedido con el COVID, lo que se ha podido evidenciar. Eh, nosotros al inicio de esta epidemia como país tuvimos realmente una gravísima situación donde en una de las ciudades más grandes lamentablemente hubo cadáveres en las calles porque no había posibilidad de dar una respuesta inmediata. Ahí se develó cómo la situación de personas excluidas que tienen que trabajar día a día para poder comer, cuya situación no permite un confinamiento en el cual puedan estar 
habitando, ya que hay mucho hacinamiento, hay gente muy pobre, en barriadas, en las que comparten personas de diferentes edades. Aquí en esta región tenemos familias ampliadas. Entonces, esas políticas que se aplicaron simplemente no fueron válidas. Desde Quimirina identificamos que teníamos que trabajar eh, apoyando en eh, medidas que no, no eran de responsabilidad de la sociedad civil. Protección social es una responsabilidad del Estado. Sin embargo, ante la ausencia del Estado fue necesario eh, apoyar inclusive en procesos de, de, de apoyo alimentario, por supuesto en temas de educación y la situación de los migrantes, de las personas que han estado obligadas a um, ir y regresar de sus países en esta parte del mundo ha visto sobre todo una situación muy complicada en relación a los venezolanos. Como nos comentó hace un momento, aquí hemos sufrido esta situación y nuestros hermanos de Venezuela en el momento de COVID se quedaron sin tratamiento. Fue Quimirín que les pudo aportar porque el Estado realmente no dio una respuesta. Desde la perspectiva de cooperación internacional, son 20 años ya que no tenemos cooperación de Estados Unidos en salud. Eh, la cooperación europea en salud es bastante limitada. Eh, estamos en proceso de transición en relación al Fondo Mundial. Y las personas que son más vulnerables, las personas que están excluidas, realmente no tienen en este momento la posibilidad de sostener algunos de sus programas. A manera de ejemplo y de manera muy rápida, les comento una experiencia que estamos llevando adelante con trabajadoras sexuales, con recursos autogenerados, intentando apoyar a este grupo que ha quedado excluido, eh, no solo del tratamiento de, de, de enfermedades comunes en ellas, entre ellas enfermedades de, de, de transmisión sexual, sino que aquí podemos ver en este ejemplo cómo estas personas cuya edad promedio es 44 años y que tienen bajos niveles de instrucción, eh, su trabajo a nivel de trabajo sexual es su principal fuente de ingresos, con un 82.9%. Ellas son cabezas de hogar en el 90%, viven solas, no tienen habitación propia. Sí ejercían la, el trabajo sexual antes de la pandemia casi en el 80%. Algunas tuvieron que abandonar el trabajo sexual por condiciones eh, ligadas con esta situación, pero también hubo algunas que comenzaron a realizar el trabajo sexual. Y esto bajo condiciones bastante inseguras. Eh, hemos tenido una prevalencia de COVID en estas personas. Excuse me, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. Um, Amira, you need to. Yeah, I finished with the last. Uh, that is the last one. Eh, después de haber escuchado. Needs to leave also. Sorry. Thank you. Can okay. you translate for her, please? Yeah. She needs to wrap up, yes, because there is another presenter. Yeah, yeah. Please. Uh, I, estoy terminando. I'm finishing now. Yes, I'm finishing with this one. Uh, yes. Lo que yo quería decir es que um, la cooperación internacional cuando ha salido de manera abrupta, sin poder eh, tener una real condición de transición, ha determinado una caída en los resultados muy fuertes. Ejemplifico de manera muy rápida esta situación que pasó en el país en relación al Fondo Mundial, pero creo que en el momento en que llevemos las preguntas y las respuestas podré eh, ampliar un poco más sobre lo planteado. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Amira. I'm sorry I had to interrupt you from your very real informative presentation, but I hope you get time after the question time, you can, uh, you can respond when people ask questions. Uh, let me just go straight to Nadia. Um, Nadia, my apologies. I'm aware that you need to leave at uh, 15.30. Please, may I have your presentation? Uh, hello, Louise, and thank you Hi. for uh, the invitation. I, I do not have a presentation. Maybe I missed to prepare it, but I no. will, uh, I will uh, talk a little bit uh, about my, uh, my experience. 
um, and uh, and a little bit to, to to give some feedback about the uh, the book, the accounted uh, book that was uh, shared with us, and uh, make some feedback on that. So um, so I work in um, in Lebanon, and I have an experience in the middle uh, in the MENA region, and uh, we have been like for the past ten years uh, partners with Alliance before, and now with Frontline as being the PR of the grant of the Global Fund, and my organization. Uh, being an SR for uh, Lebanon. So, uh, so first of all, I want to, to say that uh, what was shared about the, the booklet, about the accountant, it's very, very much uh, um, uh, precious for us because this is the first time maybe we can hear that there is a documentation that is uh, talk or reflect on our frustration. Uh, because, uh, uh, because um, yes, indeed, for example, Lebanon, it was not, it is counted as a high income country. This is how it was defined with the Global Fund for the, for the whole past years. And the first time that Global Fund accepted to, to, uh, to, to give uh, support for Lebanon when it is related to HIV, it was because of the refugees situation in Lebanon and the context after the war in Syria. So this was the first time that Lebanon was considered on the agenda of the Global Fund. So this also, it, is, it was a frustration for us and it was a, a very a bad time for us to be, a, a, to be enrolled in this fund, uh, funding uh, uh, and partnership with the international agency uh, to be able to support our communities. And also there is another issue. When we live in a country where there is um, there is uh, no priority for the key population and uh, where health it is not also a priority because we give the priority and the percentage of the budget of the government for other uh, for other field so this also create more frustration and more gaps uh, into uh, uh, like uh, supporting the kps uh, this is one another issue also when the services are not covered and the and, uh, and the government rely on the the NGOs to support services, not the the way, uh, that, not the reverse on a reverse way. So this also a frustration. And when the NGOs, for example, present for any uh, uh, to be supported with from international agency, uh, they they will look on your data and you and they will will tell you you don't have enough data, enough evidence, etc. But how you will get the evidence if you don't have any money to search and to look for the evidence and to document this evidence? So this is like a vicious circle for us as a, as a civil society. And another uh, another point also I want to mention it. Uh, when, for example, uh, Lebanon, it's on the Middle East and the Middle East and North Africa. And, you know, in the in this area, you have the Gulf countries and the Gulf countries are rich countries and the, the international uh, society look at you that you are coming from a neighbors that are rich. So why these neighbors are not supporting you? So and and you are and you cannot defend our cause very well because these uh, wealthy uh, countries uh, do not consider the key population priority for them and even it is for the culture or when you, you uh, when you see the laws for example they don't want to be involved in this in this uh, context so and this will take a lot of time for the international donor to understand this uh, gap so this also it is very uh, it is a struggle for us and it is burden for us on uh, as ngos because when you open a service and uh, like one uh, a person was talking about universal health coverage also this is another uh, another uh, uh, like uh, a new guidelines or new uh, invitation from who to be a universal health coverage and to have like one stop shop for keep kps but they don't understand that sometimes these international protocols international guidelines are very high high uh, it is a high expectation from us 
us to be able to reach this point. And if you are not able to apply this, they will not, you will not get fund. So you are between these two hammers from one, one side, all the UN agency with high level protocols and guidelines, etc. And the other side, you are in a government that does not support you, that not, not pay services, and that uh, the, and you are requested to give services. So from where you will get the money to give service and the services are, uh, are a burden because it is a cost that you have to pay every day. It's not something that you can raise money. No, it is like you pay money to, 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 to serve people. So how you will, uh, you will sustain your services? And when it comes, they will start to tell you, do more advocacy, the government should do this and that. Or they will say to you, do more fundraising, do, uh, you have to sustain your services yourself. How you will do it in a country where you have socioeconomic problems and you have other problems are more priority, for example, food, uh, now, the hygiene kits for families, for every family in Lebanon, not only for the KPs, for the others too. So you, you, you see they are, like, they are like many, many layers of challenges that we are as civil society facing nowadays. Uh, and it is very nice to have very nice agenda and international uh, protocols, etc., to be able to, 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 to implement. But at the end, we need to be supported to be able to respond to, respond to these, uh, to these uh, uh, needs. And, uh, uh, and I want to ask a question or to raise a, a very weird uh, subject. Um, if you do not uh, generate uh, data or, or or even if you are in very wealthy uh, country but in this country they don't search for the key population and they don't want to hear about them so you will not at the end serve this people this population and the hiv will raise uh, will be on a raise and you will not uh, stop hiv uh, so uh, you will not accept um, success in the 1990-90 also. So these were like some ideas that I wanted to, to share. And uh, because one issue was said also, uh, when they will give you money, they will, they, uh, the, don the donors, they will count, they will give you 100,000 and they, they will see how many people you will serve with $1,000, $1,100,000. $100,000, but, but when the life is costing and is expensive, the same amount may be in another country, they can serve all the population, but in country, for example, such Lebanon, where the life is expensive, you cannot do a lot with this amount of money. And then they will say, no, it's so expensive. For example, Lebanon, we can put the same amount in another country and we can reach other people. So what they are doing, they are also not giving enough support for the key population. Because for, for me, the key population is the same whenever they are in any country they are. And this is a human rights. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia. Um, we will go straight to our last presenter before I open the floor for questions. Our last presenter is uh, Jonathan, my good friend and colleague. Um, Jonathan, if you can uh, share your perspective as well as the debates going on uh, on the UNAIDS PCB, that would be really fantastic. Thank you. Um, Colleague, thank you, Lois, thank you. I, very little left to say after all of that, of course, because there's been a great deal put out. Um, and, and there isn't enough really in the debates in the UNAIDS PCB for me to tell you about that. But so, the, I mean, this region gets more funding than anyone else. So I, we've been in rooms globally where people kind of say, what are you moaning about? Shut up, you're getting the money. In fact, you're getting our money. But of course, the questions are, to whom does that money go in this region? decided by whom and who's counting when it comes. So I'll try to whiz through, I had six, six kind of thoughts, but two of those thoughts have been thought already. So I'll just mention them for listing, but I won't go through them again. Of course, in this region, in the last year, I've been told there are no gays in Tanzania, there are no drug users in Kinshasa, and there are no sex workers in Lusaka. And everyone else has their tails. We talked about that a lot. But when we talk about lots of money coming to the region, 
and then we have invisible people, it's the dynamic that you've spoken to. The second thing Meg speaks to in her book very eruditely and has spoken to here as well. And that is, I once saw a video on YouTube that was fascinating. It was a man taking a city block and like kind of in, in the dark at night and he swung around and he swung back to the same view and he said, in the time I did that, we've moved from a low income country to a middle income country because it went from midnight to the day after. It doesn't, it doesn't impact on the number of poor people. So, so the averages we've all seen on Facebook, we've seen the memes, 1% of the people own 90% of the wealth, the top 20 wealthy country, uh, families own X percent of the economy. That stuff doesn't balance out. It doesn't balance out into averages on GDP or even GDP per capita. So countries that are making mineral wealth from oil or in other areas, it's not having an impact on the number of people who are living in poverty. So that's been covered as well. I think something that's been implicit and but perhaps not talked about that much today is the medical medicalization of the response and therefore the medicalization of the funding that comes into the response and sticking into this region so i think i think for very good reasons and for some bad reasons we know that a lot of that funding is coming into paying for treatment um so good reasons are we're keeping people are alive and there can be no better reasons than that Bad reasons are that people at risk of dying are worse press and worse media and worse politics in elections than people at risk of becoming infected or people at risk of dying from something else that's not about the medications you're providing. So I, a lot of that funding is coming in in ways that is not incredibly useful to address all of the factors that civil society really needs, needs to be addressing. Um, Christine, right at the beginning, talked about donors having, having good reasons and rational frameworks. She's much more generous than I am to, to the analysis of donors. I, there, are, there are frameworks. Some of them are rational and some of them are useful. Um, many of them increasingly are being driven by replacing trade with aid. Where are the foreign interests of that country? Uh, to what extent has the electorate swung to the right? Uh, to what extent can we use that money on, on migrants arriving on our shores? or on research and still call it ODA and pretend it's going to development somewhere else. I think there's a lot of that. Um, and I say that in a facetious way, but it's unavoidable. Um, but I do think we must push back against those because I think the frameworks that are used are, are subject to all of those and we need to, we need to speak that in public. Um, in country, the other thing that isn't spoken about an awful lot is that the mechanisms of deciding where that money goes when it gets to, to in country. So uh, in this region, I think in, in many countries, we experience a vicious cycle. Those in power get to dominate the CCMs, which get to decide on where the money goes, which means it goes to boring, relatively unaccountable, big chunk, old fashioned, non-innovative programming, which of course is best delivered by big, chunky, old fashioned, non-innovative and boring big organizations and agencies, not the least of whom are UN agencies and it's not going into civil society. So then we manufacture um, incapacity in the country. We do evaluations, we end up with three civil society organizations at the top and we go, oh no, actually none of them had capacity, so we'll give it to the UN again. Um, and I think that's a big problem. It's a big problem for the architecture and the survivability of civil society and civil space. And it's a big problem for that cycle of boring, chunky, big, one size fits all, not counting uh, different populations. Um, Almost the last of the, of the six that I want to touch on. So Lois, I'm speeding. You, you promised me benefits in the afterlife if I sped through, so yes. I'm speeding. Uh, yes. This is not popular. Um, and I get into a lot of trouble, but I do think we must talk about it. When we talk about ideal ODA funding, uh, and we spend a lot of time moaning about how much money has left HIV and how we'd love if it came back. It's not all coming back. And we need to talk about co-financing and the possibilities of co-financing within the HIV and SRHR sphere. So, so when Lancet tells us that the, the, the biggest single improvement to child health that any government can make is keeping kids in school till longer, then we must be looking at what are the ODA budgets that are going into education? What are the ODA budgets going into um, food production, agriculture, nutrition, food security, uh, in, in um, 
emergency situations. We've talked about that already. So what are the budgets going in? And in what ways can we influence those to think better about co-joined financing where education is not just because we think it looks sweet to keep girls in school, but we're keeping them in safe schools where health is allowed to access for a change and it's having an impact on infections, teenage pregnancies, early child marriages, and a number of other person-centered uh, outcomes that we'd like to have. So to end, just two half thoughts. I, I love Meg's idea about, well, I hate it, but I love that she said it, about manufactured scarcity. Um, because it is manufactured, but, I, you know, capitalism is manufactured scarcity. That is the premise of it. Um, as long as we live in that paradigm, it's going to be there at some point. I, I think that, I don't think we pay enough attention to the manufactured scarcity of health resources domestically. So, so all health domestically is manufactured into scarcity. Again, it's the basis of capitalism. Um, and I think we ignore some of the models of countries that have made the most progress on health decades ago, China, Cuba, and others, where, where health outcomes rose dramatically over two decades without GDP rising at the same rate. So those, that thinking about how health budgets are prioritized, where they're going, the issues of corruption, um, and that manufactured scarcity internally and domestically, I think we must talk more about. And then very finally, to say nothing much about UNAIDS and the PCB, the, the, the strategy has moved through a lot, of the, the upcoming strategy that's now being spoken about frantically, has moved through a lot of process and is now only just going into content. I think it's clear, well, not, not it's clear, but we're going into a struggle for 12 result areas, four of which will be new result areas. And I think the four new ones are, uh, they're a real attempt to have people-centeredness in the response. Um, so, so even more than community to actually break that down into, into key populations and other affected people. And I think that that's important. And I think people need to intervene in that as much as possible organizationally to get the content right so that those, are, those results look good that they are funded, that they are delivered, that they are monitored, that they are measured. And thank you. Thank you very much to all our presenters. Thank you, Jonathan, for that intervention. I think there's a lot of food for thought. I will immediately open the floor for, for questions from the floor. Um, and in between, I will add my own questions. If, uh, if there are no questions from the floor. The floor is open. Please um, indicate if you want to speak so that your mic can be unmuted. Natalie. Do we have any questions in the in the chats? Okay. If um, there are no questions from the floor, any questions from the floor? Uh, Sally has a question. Yes, Sally. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for the really interesting uh, contributions and the and the and the good work done. I um, attended yesterday the 20th anniversary of Medicine Sans Frontiers in South Africa. And at the, at the event, there were activists who were um, right at the start of uh, treatment access um, uh, issues in South Africa, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s campaigning for treatment access in South Africa some really brave individuals that um, did so much excellent work. One of the things that struck me is that um, people who worked in that time in, uh, in South Africa and in the age of denialism in South Africa had the freedom sometimes to break the rules because um, the regulations and guidance then was not so regimented. Um, it was not about ticking boxes at the time, um, although that's the case now, and the flexibility that public health and NGOs can work with at this time 
is much more restrictive. The environment is much more restricted and regulated and regimented. Um, and I kind of thought when I was listening to people um, and listening to you earlier um, about uh, size estimations and data that we've become um, so tied up with data and our systems um, have become so regimented that it disallows the flexibility of NGOs who really have connections with people on the ground and who know um, how to work with communities. Earlier today, I was uh, speaking to sex workers in another, um, in another forum, and they were talking about um, not being able to, being tied up and not being able to have any flexibility to respond to, for instance, um, uh, the issues of displacement now. They can't find their clients, their clients are now um, dispersed, but they are unable to move across uh, district borders because their funding allows them to only uh, offer services within a very small area. Because now in South Africa, we have district-based funding. The Department of Health gives you funding for a very particular small area, and they're unable to, to, to speak to clients that are now dispersed. So I'm just, I'm, I, I guess I have, um, it's a bit of a mixed up sort of comment and question about how we deal with this over-regimented, um, uh, top-down dictating what, um, what uh, people are able to do. Um, when I was working at SWIT, one of the things that happened there as well is that um, there was a decision by the Global Fund to move to high density uh, metro areas for funding, which meant that we actually had to close down services for sex workers in peri-urban areas where, of course, stigma and human rights issues are far more pressing and the inability of the health system to absorb uh, those clients is, is absolutely clear. Um, and that, that decision was made somewhere else. <laughs> we, we're not really even um, aware of where, and, and our resistance to it was, was met with just a kind of flat line of, of um, this, is how, this is how the decision has been made and uh, services need to address. And those, those uh, clients have not been taken up by public health facilities because they are not able to do so. Um, yeah, so I think it would be great to hear if anybody has any experiences in providing some kind of resistance to that, <laughs> that kind of approach um, and whether anybody in the room wants to, wants to offer um, other experiences to, to, to counter that kind of um, uh, decision making. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Sally, for both a, a short presentation and a question. I think any of the panelists who is open to respond. But there is a, a second question in, the, in my screen. Uh, the question is part of the rationale of using GNI in the Global Fund, for example, is the argument that extensive domestic resources should be used for health rather than international donor funds. How do we find new ways to interrogate and rewire the politics under this old way of thinking? that is very common and so damaging. Can we take a third question before I open to the panelists? I think Christine has one in the chat box also. In some, in some countries has COVID made people more visible partly what Amina said, and can that be an opportunity to shift the discourse about data? So I will open the floor for the panelists to, to respond. Um, Sarah, do you want to go first? Please. Sure, thanks. Uh, great questions and thank you so much to the panelists for these powerful uh, interventions and yeah, just really amazing experiences and work. Um, I think, you know, just to take David's question first about GNI per capita, um, because that's one I'm probably best positioned to talk to. Part of the reason why we don't have a really more thoughtful framework like the one that Frontline AIDS has developed for selecting which countries get prioritized is because bilateral donors, so the US, UK, Europe, et cetera, use GNI per capita and are in some cases required to use GNI per capita in order to factor that into their priority setting. And so if the Global Fund eliminated GNI per capita as its main criterion, they might lose some of the major donors. 
And so that means that actually to really interrogate this and challenge this, you have to actually engage with the bilateral donors, I think. We, we tend to get caught up in the global fund because that's one we have access to, but actually it's really driven from the capitals. And this is, comes back to this question of how we decolonize global health. Part of it is by challenging donor dominance and, and donor hegemony of, of these processes. Um, you know, and I think also when we look at how PEPFAR picks their countries or how the UK picks their countries, how fast track countries are picked, it's, you know, some of it's rational, some of it is justifiable, some of it is politics. Some of it is foreign policy agendas, you know? So uh, France is always going to prioritize Francophone Africa. Maybe they should, maybe they have an obligation considering all the harm that was done under colonialism. But at the same time, you know, we might wanna question how countries are setting their, their own priorities and how that then shapes the priorities of the UN. You know, why for instance, fast track maps, sometimes they include China as a fast track country and sometimes they don't. So that's interesting, right? What's that all about? So I think it's good to question this, but I think we have to start with the donors. And I also think one of the real risks and one of the things I saw happen a lot on the Global Fund Board was pitting key populations one against the other, saying, you know, middle-income countries, key populations, you guys are so empowered and vocal and, you know, you're discriminating against key populations in Africa. And so one of the powerful things that happened during the eligibility fight was the key population groups in Africa wrote a letter to the Global Fund, which never got published, but I'm telling you about it now. Um, which said, don't, don't do that. We stand with our colleagues in Russia. We stand with our peers in Lebanon and you know, Latin America, et cetera. So uh, that solidarity is very powerful. I'll let, maybe someone else wants to tackle some of the other questions. Yes, um, Amira, do you, would you like to respond? Yo quisiera eh, responder algo también. Eh, yo, yo lo que creo es que también desde las comunidades, a nivel global, nosotros tenemos que construir evidencia. Tenemos que poner en claro cuál es la situación que está sucediendo y ahí me parece que hay una comunidad internacional que de alguna manera, por ejemplo, con Frontline, logramos establecer también con otros movimientos, con Coalición Plus, pero que la respuesta comunitaria diga su verdad y también eh, sea, por supuesto, con evidencia científica y que también hagamos incidencia en, en los estamentos supranacionales para que puedan ver, por ejemplo, en evolución qué es lo que pasa con mortalidad. Porque yo creo que a veces estamos llenándonos de algunas intenciones sin medir exactamente qué es lo que está pasando con, con las personas que están dejadas atrás. Y finalizo diciendo que con el COVID nosotros tenemos la obligación, los países, pero también las comunidades de identificar qué ha pasado con nuestras poblaciones. ¿Cómo es esto de que no hay que dejar a nadie atrás, pero la gente que ha sufrido fuertemente por el COVID en relación a salud y en relación a la economía, eh, debemos construir una nueva agenda? Great. We need to build a new agenda. You couldn't have said it better. Any panelists uh, who still wants to respond to those uh, earlier questions? Jonathan? Um, thanks, just very quickly. I, I love the idea of, of uh, Sally's idea of data resistance. Um, <laughs> I, I, what we haven't talked about, interestingly enough, is the whole much vaunted UN, UN data revolution. Um, you know, and I think there's a danger that turns into the data death star, and then we do have to become the resistance. But there were also some good features and some good concepts in that data revolution around uh, communi community sourcing, crowdsourcing, unusual channels, unusual sources of data, new ways of looking at small data being enveloped and not enveloped, absorbed and used in big data. And I think I think it's useful to go back to that. And then, of course, the the, the question around has COVID made people more visible. Well, in South Africa in particular, COVID has reinforced that people are vectors of disease to be feared, ordered around, and if necessary, shot down in the street. Um, you know, the greater good has been prioritized at the expense, even when it's at the expense of certain populations within that. Um, and it just reinforces everything we do to, to women, to young people, to others in this region, to key populations. Of, of marginalizing, infantilizing, and having them as subjects of health and not agents of health. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Wana? 
Um, yeah, I want to comment on the on the two questions about the COVID. Um, the the I mean, in our experience, COVID um, does make some group uh, become visible. Um, for example, in Vietnam, because our government doesn't like to see homeless people, so usually the streets are clean. You come to to big city in Vietnam, you don't see homeless people because they are being hidden um so when in a big city you don't really see people um you don't post them now but when the country is developed you see homeless people so the only people on the street are homeless people um now there was robbery and farmers because they are okay. those usually is usually in country like us. Also, I think the Am I? I have lost her. Am I we've the only just one? Lost, no, we've just lost her. Okay. Um, while she's coming back, uh, Sarah, you wanted to respond to the COVID question? Yeah, thank you. I was so glad um, Christine asked about COVID. Um, so I just wanted to flag, I think there's a real risk that we just repeat all the same mistakes that we made with HIV and are still making with HIV. And uh, one of the concerns I have, I was just on the call, I, maybe other people were on this as well for the ACT and uh, Accelerator, I think it was yesterday on civil society engagement and they presented kind of the approach and it just looks very biomedical and really not enough yet analysis of inequality, discrimination, how that will impact on access to both the future vaccine when we have one and treatment when we have treatment. Um, and I'm especially concerned about the group that Juan mentioned earlier uh, which is uh, migrants, because we've seen already, for instance, in Singapore, where they were relying on this, this uh, digital contact tracing app to try to trace COVID cases, and they completely left out migrants. Um, and so there were like 700 migrants or more in a stuck in a dorm, they weren't allowed to leave, and they were just, COVID was just going rampant throughout the dormitory. And they none of them had the app because they didn't have phones. So I think you know the same kinds of issues of quantification and visibility and stigma are going to repeat themselves unless we address them. Ah, Juan is back. Yes, Juan, we are back to you, please. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was uh, dropped out. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's it's also I think it's an opportunity for us um, as civil society to to amplify, um, to augment it, the, the image or the, the visibility of the, of the population that usually um, before the time of COVID um, was not seen as hidden um, by, by, the, um, by the society, by the um, political um, agenda. So I think that is one thing. Um, um, and 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 to mobilize the solidarity to them. So I think that's um, that uh, in during the COVID, we um, SCDI is working a lot on distributing food for homeless people and eventually create some understanding and and sympathy of the population to the homeless people and the slum and dollar. And I think that's that is possible. Thank you. Can I give this opportunity yeah. to... Hello, Wana? Yes. Have you... Did you... Were you finished? You kind of frozen? Um, no, you, you want to... You want to invite other people to speak, then please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, can I just ask uh, Christine Enrique uh, if you have any reactions to the discussions? And then I will take one last question uh, from the floor. Who do you want to Any thoughts? <laughs> Christine, any thoughts, any reactions to the 
whole discussions and what you had today? To, uh, so many, too little time to say them. I'll just thank you to all of you. I think it feels like there, there could be a lot, you know, there's a lot more conversations that are connected to this one conversation. It would be really lovely if we found a way to, you know, make use of the fact that we have to hang out on Zoom to try and have those conversations. Because yes, ultimately we know there, you know, um, we know what's wrong with the system and we know who's going to be, who's missed out and who is not going to um, be addressed um, by, you know, donor funding, by interventions, by programs, by all of those things. But we also know um, it is very difficult, a very difficult system to shape. And I, I do agree with John um, and his, you know, we know that the bigger agenda that shapes the agenda around resources is often not the one that is openly on the table, right? So we're fighting, it's, it's, it's like a bit like all the other things that we do in HIV, we're fighting a technical, we're having a technical conversation about something that requires political change. And so we keep on back into those um, slightly frustrating conversations, I think, but at the same time, if more of us are having conversations, and I think if more of us are coming up with alternatives and different ways of seeing things and counting, that's why I was asking Amira about the question when I understood, if I understood her rightly, I think, you know, COVID has kind of brought people to the fore that Kimarina for a long time said they are there, but they're not being counted. Your data is incorrect. So there wasn't a, 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 a moment where you could enter the conversation from a different perspective. So maybe that's kind of where I'm sitting at the moment thinking, is this the moment where we can re-engage re in these conversations at a, at, in a different time with a different perspective, just because you know sometimes we need to make opportunities out of bad situations. And I think maybe this is one of those, but ultimately it's a political conversation. And the, the question around who's not being counted is a political conversation. And the question of where resources go very often is a political conversation and not a, and not a technical assessment about where it is needed most. But I really wish we have more of those open conversations with where we can think together. And I know it's challenging and, you know, we fall off the grid and uh, we, our, our, our um, conversation gets a bit wobbly with the internet, but we can manage. And that's exactly why we have grown strong as a movement and as a community, because we have talked to each other and it is built on solidarity. We have always known and we know that in frontline aids that it's important to work in Latin America, even if everybody says it's not a fast track, track country, it's not a there, there isn't enough to invest and it's not important enough. We have always we have always built our work and our network around solidarity and we will continue to do that. So, yeah, I hope we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Yes, uh, Enrique, one minute. No, I think along the same lines and I think that's why First of all, thank you, all of your panelists. It's been, a, a, as we expected, a, a great conversation. And I think that, you know, what Meg has written is something very important. It's like we need to put out on, on the table uh, that, yes, what, what Chrissy said, we're having a technical discussion on something that is political, but it's worse than that. It is the, the data is being used for political purposes. I think that's the genesis of, of the book of Meg's. We need to take out that cloth, that cloak of, oh, you know, if it is data, it is all technical, it is all fine, because the, those are dangerous territories. You know, the modeling that Nick mentions in the book, uh, the, the very, the, 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 the political assessment of the data, so that it looks technical, but it's still political. We need to put it out of the table, expose it. People don't talk about that. You just follow whatever, whatever the donor is telling you, or whatever the, the UN agency is telling you. I think there's a conversation about the UN agencies as well. They, they are in a way, they are make, making a, a mantle of technical um, acceptance to things that are political and driven by donors and others. So yeah, we need to talk about more about this. We have to expose all this and have a conversation that demystifies the fact that, you know, if it is in a figure, in a data, in a nice graph, then it should be all right and it's not political. Amira, one last word. Thank you so much. I think uh, the commitment is is necessary to continue with uh, with work, community work in scientific evidence for political uh, results. Mm. 
Thank you. Um, final, final, final word back to Sarah Meg Davis. Um, listening to all this, and we are very grateful that you are giving us a 20% discount for the book. Uh, so I hope that everyone here will read the book. As uh, Chris said at the beginning, we will arrange more platforms to continue this discussion. And we hope that you can continue to come and share with us um, your thinking as we are moving forward, because we do need to get into the space where we start thinking about the what. So what do we do? As, is it something as radical as Sally suggested, uh, which is the data resistance? Or is, do we need to get into the political space and you know, start talking the political language and find some ways of bringing this discussion back to the table in a more open space? to where eligibility criteria is really looked at. I think frontline aids really is onto something uh, from what Enrique presented. That's an alternative that is right there. And we need to look at how that can be expanded and be used in certain circumstances. Um, Sarah, would you like to say just one second, one last word before I close? Thank you so much. I think the, the most important thing is to keep asking the questions and to ask to not ever assume that a graph is an authority or a number is an authority. Ask questions, who shaped it, why, whose agenda, what are the assumptions, what's included, what's left out, and, and engage. Because uh, I don't think, unfortunately, we can resist, and that's valid, but it's not going to go away. So even better to go in there and, and wrestle with the machinery, as I know all of you do so, so powerfully in, in different ways. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you, Frontline Aids. I'm deeply grateful for this conversation. And thank you to the interpreters for making it all work. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much to all of you. You were fantastic presenters. You were fantastic participants. Really exciting discussion. I wish to apologize to uh, those that I cut off. Uh, for example, Amira, my apologies. I wanted to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to say something and we will still have a discussion in the end. Um, so please watch the space. We will invite you again to our next session. Thank you to everybody and uh, good night. Thank you, Lois. Thank you for your facilitation. Great as ever. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank great. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.